believe that the law of the Lord is perfect. And, you know, Leviticus 20, 13 clearly says, if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. And, you know, as a Christian, I believe the Bible, and that's where I get my belief. What you have to understand is that the Bible commands that certain people be put to death, not by me, not by Christians. It's obviously not my job or the job of any Christian to go out and kill anybody, and I've never taught anything like that. But rather that the government's job is to punish criminals and to execute those who committed capital crimes. And according to the Bible, homosexuality is a capital crime. And oh, oh, okay. <sighs> How to respond to this. My name is Paul Anthony Turner. I am Christian. I am celibate and I am gay. My relationship with Jesus has always been strong. It's always been something that I've wanted to go after. And there's only been one time in my life thus far where I felt that God didn't love me or that it was very hard to believe that he did. That was during my undergraduate years where I fell in love with one of my closest friends. I would lay in my bed feeling like a hypocrite for feeling these kinds of ways, not knowing what to do with these feelings, um, and not having anyone really to talk to about it because there's a sense of shame. You know, here I am, a pastoral intern, and I'm struggling in a way that I shouldn't be struggling. And you don't really have anyone to talk about this with because you're afraid of talking to your family about it because you don't want them to start treating you differently. You don't want to talk to your your boss about it because you know, you're know you supposed to be this spiritual leader. And when you talk to God about it, it seems like he's just not listening. And so there were times I said, well, God, if you're not, gonna, if you're not going to make me straight, because at that time I was asking God to make me straight, I said, that would fix something. If you're not gonna make me straight, at least do me the favor of taking my life because I won't do it myself, but maybe you would and put me out of my misery. Up until I went through that eight-month existential crisis. I was very judgmental of queer people. I would not, for instance, I would not have been wearing this shirt with this rainbow flag on it. I would not have identified myself as LGBT+. I would never have gone to a pride parade or anything like that. Because I refused to experience life as a queer person. I refused to, under, to go through the struggles that queer people go through. But after going through this crisis of faith, I learned to have compassion, not only for other queer people, but for myself. And from that experience, I learned being a queer person of faith, being a Christian queer person is a reality. It is a real thing. It's not an oxymoron. It's my, it's my everyday experience. really feels, it, it just feels very lonely sometimes. Sometimes it can be very lonely, it, it can be very difficult because people don't understand, you know, why, why I choose to be single or why I choose, on, on the one hand, or why I choose to be, to, to celebrate the fact that I'm gay on the other hand. The majority of the time when I start feeling single, when I start feeling lonely is when I'm sitting in a church where the pastor gives yet another sermon about why marriage is so great and why marriage is the only way that you're gonna to get to know Jesus in the best way possible. It's the only way that you're gonna be able to find um, social and, and relational intimacy in this life. On the one hand, you wanna tell them that marriage and having a romantic partner are like the best thing in the world. And that in order for you to know God to the fullest and to really have emotional and social intimacy, you need to get married. But then on the other hand, you also tell them, you tell queer people that you can't get married. So it's basically, you're telling queer people, you need to commit soul, you're, you basically need to live a life of perpetual social and emotional suicide. That's essentially what you're telling them. The fact that Paul, you know, wrote uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, you know, chapter 7 where he said, you know, 
if you can be single, it's for the best. You know, I would prefer that you would be single like me because you can do all these things for the kingdom of God and so forth. And there's a way that I and my singleness have, have learned to connect with God that I would not have learned if I were married. But the church doesn't look at the fact that Paul wrote that. And that Paul, the greatest theologian in the Bible, arguably, was a single man. And it also glosses over the fact that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, was also single. Being in a church where we don't recognize the fact that our, our leader was a single man, it kind of, it just really makes it, it makes it kind of difficult sometimes for us to go in church and hear, you know, hear these sermons about marriage and hear all these different seminars about family and about raising kids. And it kind of just puts one group on a pedestal and kind of, you know, knocks us out of the discussion. It kind of creates these walls of division, these different groups, and we don't belong there. That's the biggest difficulty that I've had being a single gay Christian. I don't know how I'm gonna be a pastor in this church. Uh, because, as you can imagine, you know, being gay, just it just greatly impedes any progress in finding a job. Because I, I celebrate the fact that I'm gay and I refuse to live in the closet and not talk about the life that I live, it's caused, it's caused some difficulties with, with my conference and to the point, to the point where I don't know when, if, where I'll be pastoring. Our, our policies allow for um, gay people who hold to the same standards of the church to occupy pastoral positions. And apparently I won't be able to, or at least not without a fight. I've gone through two and a half years of my master's in divinity um, studies. I've gone through a BA in, in theology and now I don't know where I'm going to go. And this is symptomatic of a, a bigger issue of how queer people are treated in general. Um, to the point, you know, it's, it, it's to the point where a, a person who's queer and is abiding by the, you know, upholds the policies and, and theological standards of the church still can't find employment in this church because of, of, of a variety of different factors. Our president getting up and saying that it was all right for two women to marry or two men to marry. I tell you right now, I was disappointed bad, uh, but I tell you right there, as sorry as you can get, the Bible's again it, God's again it, I'm again it, and if you've got any sense, you're again it. <laughs> sorry. I had a way, I figured a way out a way to get rid of all the lesbians and queers, but I couldn't get it past the Congress. Build a great, big, large fence, 150 or 100 mile long, put all the lesbians in there, fly over and drop some food. Do the same thing with the queers and the homosexuals and have that fence electrified until they can't get out feed them and, and you know what in a few oh. years they'll die out okay do you know why they can't reproduce wow okay wow okay that's that's yeah it, it actually amazes me when <sighs> it amaz it amazes me these pastors or other so-called Christians when they they say these really wicked things about about anybody. I mean, it really betrays the kind of evil spirit they have inside of them while they're trying to say that someone else has an evil spirit in them. I mean, Christ would never, never talk about a, a group of people or anyone like this pastor is talking about them. And yeah, that's mind-blowing, yeah. <laughs> No homos will ever be allowed on this church as long as I'm the pastor here. Never! <laughs> <laughs>
Those hateful words are from the mouth of a Tempe pastor preaching that God's word says that killing gay people is the only way to get rid of AIDS by Christmas. He says all gays are pedophiles. He says the biggest hypocrite in the world is the person who believes in the death penalty for murderers but not for homosexuals. Pastor Steven Anderson has agreed to join us tonight for an exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview. Pastor Anderson, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me on. Have you always hated gay people? Is it something your father taught you or is it something that you came to on your own? No, I haven't always. You know, I grew up in a Christian home, but it wasn't until I read the Bible cover to cover at age 17 that I discovered the truth of what the Bible really says because a lot of passages don't ever get preached from the pulpit because they're simply not popular. I have to be honest, when, when I heard your sermon, it sounded like the rantings of someone who was either a hate monger or a religious zealot, and I'm wondering which are you? Well, I'm a religious zealot, and you know, I love the Bible, I love God's Word, I believe that the law of the Lord is perfect, and you know, Leviticus 20:13 clearly says, if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. And you know, as a Christian, I believe the Bible, and that's where I get my belief. Now, doesn't the Ten Commandment, isn't the first commandment, thou shalt not kill? No, the first commandment is thou shalt have no other gods before me. Okay, but it, um, it, of course, is thou shalt not kill a, one of the commandments? Yes, it is, but what you have to understand is that the Bible commands that certain people be put to death, not by me, not by Christians. It's obviously not my job or the job of any Christian to go out and kill anybody, and I've never taught anything like that. But rather that the government's job is to punish criminals and to execute those who've committed capital crimes. And according to the Bible, homosexuality is a capital crime. And oh, oh, okay. How to respond to this? There's so much, there's so much to be said about why these pastors are so wrong in their rhetoric. The fact that a pastor thinks that it is in any way right to countenance hatred of anybody on earth, any people group, or any person for any reason, demonstrates to me that they don't have the Spirit of God in them. And it seems that these pastors have gotten so caught up in their theological discussions about a people group that they don't actually know the people group. If these pastors and other Christians who have these kinds of ideas would actually sit down with other queer people and get to know them, they wouldn't be able to say these kinds of hideous things. I can guarantee you these pastors don't know queer people and how wonderful queer people are. They're just looking at, they're looking at this matter through a very myopic, in a very myopic kind of way. And when you look at people through a lens of sin, and treat them like they're these sinners, these outcasts that we have to punish and destroy, there's no way that you're going to be able to bring the healing, the healing that Jesus wants to bring the world. And so these people, so-called Christians, are the chief reason why queer people are leaving the churches and don't think that they can follow Christ. Because those people who claim to be followers of Christ are basically telling them that there's no place for you in the church there's no place for you in the arms of God. God hates you and I hate you too. This is nothing more, this is like, the, this is the spirit of Antichrist, uh, honestly, it's, and it's really sickening. Jesus is the first thing I think about in the morning and the last thing I think about. He is my best friend. He is the reason I'm alive. He is my whole world. My world would fall apart. It would fragment into a million pieces if I didn't have Jesus there holding my life together. I quite literally cannot imagine even a hypothetical world in which Jesus wasn't in my life. He is absolutely everything to me. Right now, I'm really thankful I get to work with an LGBT plus care group at 
at my university right now where I get to kind of, in a, in a sense, function as a pastor in a certain way. And it's been a very humbling, a humbling experience to work with um, LGBT plus people who have a variety of different ethical beliefs on this matter. But when we come together, we don't discuss the theology. We know where each other stands and we respect each other just the same. And where I'm going next, and since I'm going to be returning back home, is I want to live in a part of town where there are a lot of LGBT plus people. And I want to work as a, as a kind of unofficial pastor, creating safe spaces for LGBT plus people to come and know Jesus. We're not gonna theologize over whether you should be getting get a gay marriage or whether you should not. Even though I, I have my stance on that, quite frankly, per the situation that we are in right now, it's just a very difficult, a very difficult topic right now. And I think that because of how the church has dug its hills in in this matter, we're making it unnecessarily difficult for gay people to even get to know Jesus. It's kind of like we expect gay people to adopt the law of a king they don't know. And that's really backward to me. And so I want to introduce as a pastor, whether I'm going to be working officially as a pastor or unofficially, I want to, I want to create a space for, I want to create a church, a, a community for LGBT plus people to, and, and, and other people who feel disenfranchised from the church or outcast from the church, I want to give them a place where they can meet Jesus and we can grow together. And I'll, I will trust that as we grow together as a community and as they grow in Christ, Christ will guide them to where they need to be um, regarding this matter. I just want, I want to be a pastor for, I want to be a pastor for queer people.